Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. Today we'll play a little bit with the tile size that we are using for light culling and examine how it relates to the performance. Then we are going to wrap up everything that's got to do with light culling so we can move on to the next topic in the series. In the last video, we had a high-level discussion of how thread groups are executed in waves of 32 or 64 threads. My computer has an NVIDIA graphics card, so a thread group of 256 threads would execute in 8 waves. The number of thread groups, as well as the number of waves that can run concurrently on each GPU core can differ per graphics adapter and manufacturer. However, it's possible that the 8 waves which we are using here don't utilize the full capacity of the GPU core they are running on. Let's see what happens if we increase the size of thread groups to a maximum of 1024 threads. This can be done by changing the tile size that's used for grid frustums and light culling. A tile size of 32 pixels will result in the desired number of threads. We have to set this number in 4 places. That's where we compile the shaders, the light culling tile size constant, the tile size in the test shader, and the final one is in the post process shader. Note that having larger tiles also results in fewer frustums, which need less data and fewer intersection tests with lights. Also, the used group shared memory per GPU core will be 4 times less with larger tiles. Let's have a look at the performance of the optimized shader with 64,000 lights. We get around 110 FPS, which is twice as much. With 4000 lights, we get 516 FPS, which is about 30% faster. Of course, we also have to know the performance of the base implementation with the larger tiles in order to be able to do a fair comparison. So with 4000 lights, we get 348 FPS. And with 64,000 lights, we get around 39 FPS. So with the base implementation, the performance gain is even larger, probably because of the fewer intersection tests, which is the least performant part of the shader. Now it wouldn't be fair to count this gain as a result of an optimization, because all we did was change the configuration of the thread groups. Also, I haven't tested this with an AMD GPU, and although we get a significant boost on my machine, it's possible that the gain wouldn't be as high or even less on other GPUs. I recommend playing with different tile sizes and see which one gives the best performance for your GPU. And feel free to let me know what your FPS numbers are in the comments below. In the previous video, we also changed how the number of lights is written into the light grid buffer. So if you want to still be able to visualize the light culling tiles, we need to update the post process shader. Here we simply add the number of point lights and spotlights to get the total number of lights. 
Also, I just realized that I forgot to show you what the cone frostums look like when we visualize them. Since the frostum data format is different when we are using bounding spheres, we need to read the data differently, again using conditional compilation. Here the only thing worth visualizing is the cone direction, which we can do simply by taking its absolute value and use it as the color. Oh, of course we need to use the correct variable name for this. I'll also fully overwrite the rendered image with frostum colors. There you go. It's all pink and blue, which I also think is prettier than the red-green checker pattern we get when visualizing frostum plane normals. And here is the heat map visualization of the number of lights per tile. Note how the tiles are larger now. That's pretty much all for shader optimization. Let me write a quick note on how we are calculating the view space depth in the light calling shader. Please see this video where I explain this transformation which is quicker than using the whole projection matrix. While I'm writing this, I'd like to note that there are probably more things that can be done in order to improve the light calling performance. However, for realistic workloads, the time that's spent on light calling is already less than a millisecond for a 4K resolution. So even if you'd manage to cut that in half, we would gain half a millisecond at best. Therefore, I think it would be more productive to concentrate on optimizing other places first. I summarized the implementation of light calling and the performance measurements in written text, which you can read here. You can find the link in the video description. For the remainder of the video, I'd like to write the code for lighting with attenuation. As you see here, the code is missing right now. We can add this code easily by copying what we already have and add an attenuation variable using the smooth step function. This function returns a smooth hermit interpolation between 0 and 1 if its third parameter is in the range between the first two parameters. These are the minimum and maximum values for the range. I'm just putting some arbitrary range here to make it look nice. It's of course physically incorrect and unrealistic. We'll do physically based lighting in a later video, after we have support for textures. Finally, we call calculate lighting function, which uses funk shading to calculate the pixel color. And we repeat this for spotlights. Looks like I forgot to multiply the light color with the attenuation variable. Okay, this is what it looks like now. I think the lights may be a bit too dim, so let's make them brighter.
This looks better. I see there is still a sharp transition from light to dark in the spotlights. We are going to fix that in a minute, but let me check if I can find any artifacts or anything out of place. Looks all fine and colorful. In order to have a nice transition from light to dark, we can use another smooth step to make the light intensity go from 1 for pixels within the spotlight's umbra to 0 for pixels outside of penumbra. And as you can see, everything looks a lot softer now. I'll lower the directional light intensity, so we can see other lights even better. Oh, I was building the project in release this whole time, and now that I switched back to debug, I see that we are still using the light type in this assertion, which we need to fix. Well, let's just remove it. Finally, I'll randomize the light direction a bit better for generated lights. And I guess we are done. So initially I just wanted to write the base implementation for light culling and then move on to importing textures, but I got carried away with optimizing the shader and how we read light data on the GPU. So I hope you didn't mind the extra time we spent doing this, because now we have got an excellent basis for our lighting system, which we can expand later for physically based rendering, lighting transparent objects, light probes and decals. Before wrapping this up, I'd like to really emphasize my appreciation for all the help and answers I received to my weird and dumb questions from the good folks of DirectX Discord server. Without their help, it would have taken me a lot longer to figure out how things work on the GPU and achieve the results which we did in the light calling videos, for which I am very grateful. Well, that's it for this video. In the next episode, we'll start working on importing textures. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.